We are living in a time when we are better connected than ever before. And as soon as something happens anywhere in the world, we know about it straight away. But with so much information at our fingertips, it can be hard to sift out the really important from the superficial. For many people, the Bible seems a bit outdated, boring, or just plain hard to understand. What can the Bible possibly say to us in the 21st century? Have I ever read the Bible? No. Yes. I read parts of oh, the Bible. Yeah, I read the whole thing. As a kid, I did. I used to have like our own like special ones. We used to have like the child Bibles with like Jesus and like the kids and sit under a tree and stuff like that. Like in elementary school, we read it, yeah. I've skimmed it. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, <laughs> the other guys. <laughs> I know the one about that guy in his colourful cloak. Um... Do I think the Bible is relevant? I think uh, parts of it are definitely relevant, but a lot of it might be a little bit out of date. I honestly don't remember anything from the Bible. I think the lessons that it teaches are anything, yeah. It's relevant to Bibles, maybe for some people, but not me. I think the Bible is inspirational and kind of frustrating at times. In the 18th century, the French philosopher Voltaire predicted that the Bible would become a museum piece within a hundred years of his lifetime and replaced by more advanced philosophies. But today, the Bible remains the most popular book in the world, the most successful literary creation of all time. Each year, over 100 million Bibles are sold or given away. The YouVersion Bible app has been downloaded over 200 million times. The Bible is the best-selling book of the year, every year. In fact, it's so popular that it's excluded from weekly bestseller lists. The Bible would be the top seller every single week, week in, week out. Many people would say that the Bible is the most popular book of all time because it's also the most powerful. It has the power to change individuals and to change societies. On her coronation day, the Queen of England was handed a Bible with the words, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. The Bible is incredibly precious. The writer of the Psalms describes the Bible as being more precious than gold. In fact, it's so precious that some have even risked their lives to share it with others. I want to say a big thank you to Alpha Canada for letting us use uh, their videos to help us with this series. Um, as we just saw, um, people have varying views of the Bible. Some people are inspired by it. Other people see the Bible as irrelevant for 21st century living. And other people have been so transformed by it and believe in it so deeply that they've been willing to give their lives for it. And uh, so we're going to talk this morning about can we trust the Bible? We're starting a new series of scripture talks called Questioning Our Inner Skeptic. And before we um, are tempted to dismiss this series as being for somebody else, uh, we need to acknowledge that all of us have an inner skeptic. We have uh, moments in our lives when we struggle with um, trust and uh, doubt seems to get the upper hand in our lives. And uh, one thing we need to again be clear about is that uh, people who have an honest faith also have honest questions. And uh, as we say around King Street, um, on the other side of an honest question is uh, the potential for uh, a deeper faith. So uh, we're going to walk through this series of scripture talks and we're going to question the inner skeptic. So we're going to acknowledge that we have one, that all of us have moments when we can be skeptical and maybe bordering even on cynical. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to question uh, the inner skeptic and hopefully, um, hopefully have a deeper faith when it's all over. And so, um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. There's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of truth and honesty in that statement or prayer. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Uh, Jesus had a lot of answers and he shared them with his, um, his audience in his, in his day. But Jesus also asked a lot of questions. And uh, we can as well as a faith community and even those who are at the edges of faith, uh, we can ask questions. Um, our faith is not incongruent with, with asking 
asking searching questions. So as has been our custom over the last number of years, we're, we have a passage to ponder that we're going to keep with us during the next few weeks. And it's taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, the words will be on the screen. If you're comfortable uh, reading it with me, it goes like this. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared, or we could say, uh, always be ready to think things through. Always be prepared or think things through to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I've always loved this passage because uh, Peter, who was a friend of Jesus, um, understood the heart of his Lord. And he said, you know, it's really important that people of faith uh, work through their faith so that they're able to explain clearly to other people why they believe what they believe. And then that last statement at the end, he says, by the way, and when you do this, when you've thought things through and you go to communicate it clearly to others, make sure you um, have conversations that are full of gentleness and respect. Um, because we're all in the process of learning and growing and, and working out our, our faith and developing hopefully a, a clearer worldview as we move along. So um, yeah, First Peter 3.15, we'll take this passage with us over the next few weeks. So this morning, we're going to consider uh, three questions. The first one is, what is the Bible and is it credible? The second one is, why should we read the Bible? And then thirdly, uh, how to read the Bible and understand it. So um, there are some, um, again, digital notes for you, www.kingstreet.org if that helps you, but um, we'll move through this teaching time together over the next few moments we have left. So here's the first one. What is the Bible and is it credible? Uh, the host of the Alpha Clip um, made this statement. Many people would say that the Bible is the most popular book because it is the most powerful and it has the potential and power to change individuals and ultimately to potentially change societies. Um, I, I believe that's true. Um, so what if, what if that statement is absolutely true? What if it holds out potential to literally change individuals and families and whole communities and societies and cultures what if there is potential and power for transformation as we consider the Bible? What if it's more than just classic literature? What if it's more than just a historical document from another time and another place? What if it literally holds out promise for you and I to become literally the best versions of ourselves? What if they, the Bible can provide wisdom for navigating the complexities of 21st century living? Um, so, is the Bible credible and what really is the Bible? The Bible makes some really bold claims about itself. Uh, in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, uh, the writer says this, for the word of God is active and it's alive. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Even if it was possible to divide soul and spirit, the writer says it's sharp enough to do that. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so when we come to the Bible and we read it with an open mind and an open heart, this writer seems to say that the Bible has the power to actually speak to the core issues of your life and to actually help us um, deal with ourselves. And so the Bible makes bold claims that it's active and that it's uh, alive. It's a living document, it's a living book. It's not trapped in some other era of, of history, though some may see it as irrelevant for these days. Uh, the Bible makes a bold claim and says that it's, it's active, it's, it's, uh, it's alive, and it has something to say. Uh, Paul, one of the early Christian leaders, he wrote to a friend of his named Timothy. He was a young pastor. And in the second letter he wrote to Timothy, uh, chapter three of that book, verse 16, he says, all scripture is God breathed. So like Paul says that this document we call the Bible actually has literally the breath of God inspiring it. And uh, these, these, are, these are really, really bold claims. In fact, the Bible actually says that um, Holy Scripture is not confined to just one era of time, but it transcends time, it transcends culture, it transcends places in history. And uh, listen to the prophet Isaiah from uh, a few thousand years ago. He says, um, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Again, bold claims that this book, this sacred text that we call the Bible is uh, active and alive 
uh, that it's God breathed, it's inspired by God, and that it endures forever. It transcends time and culture. I saw a movie a few years ago now called um, Hacksaw Ridge, and it's uh, based on a true story. Um, the true story of a military private uh, named Desmond Doss, played by Andrew Garfield. And he uh, actually won, in real life, a Congressional Medal of Honor um, by fighting in World War II and declining or refusing to bear arms in the middle of the war. So he was drafted into the military. He went to participate, but he refused to bear arms. And it is a powerful story where if you've seen the movie, at the end of the movie, um, Private Doss is rescuing 75 injured um, comrades on the battlefield who were left to die, but he went back for them unarmed, rescued them, saved them, and, and brought them back to, to safety. And um, if you watch the movie, you'll discover that he was a man of faith in Jesus and that he had high regard for the Bible. He kept his Bible with him. He would read it. He would pray. The Bible informed his um, pacifist worldview where he just said, I can't bear arms. I can't kill another human being. And uh, he had his life transformed by the Bible and by the God who inspired it. So uh, what is the Bible? The Bible is one of the significant ways that God chooses to reveal himself to us. Um, God reveals himself to us in lots of ways. The Bible teaches that out in nature, there is a demonstration of the character of God. Uh, the first chapter of the book of Romans, um, Paul writes that uh, we can understand who God is by looking at all of nature around us. It's called general revelation. We get a general idea that there is a all-powerful, wise, creative God who has, who has made us. And uh, the Psalms talk about how the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Uh, they, they, they actually whisper to us and maybe even sometimes at the right time just kind of shout to us that God is real and present and that he is off the charts awesome. And God speaks to us through our conscience. He speaks to us through conversations. He speaks to us through the circumstances of life. But most reliably, God speaks to us through the Bible. Um, we learn about God's character when we read the Bible. Uh, a lot of people in our country would believe that God exists. Where we have um, really engaging and rigorous conversations when we talk about what is he like and, uh, and who is he? And uh, does he have personal attributes or is he a force for good in the universe? And, and there are some people who, who will not give God personal attributes, but they'll just describe God as the universe. Um, well, when we read the Bible, we get a clear picture of who God is. It's his self-revelation. Uh, and so if you consider this uh, Psalm, Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, listen to this. This is how we learn what God is. The Lord is gracious, which means he gives us what we don't deserve. He's benevolent and kind, open-handed and generous. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. So when we read that verse from Psalm 145, we learn about what God is like and what his character is like. And so um, the Bible is one of the most significant ways we can learn about who God is, how he reveals himself to us. The Bible is also primarily a salvation story. From beginning to end, 66 books of the Bible, there is a common thread or narrative that's weaved through the stories through thousands of years. And uh, we learn that God is on a mission to rescue human beings. He is uh, on a uh, salvation mission. And right from the opening pages of Genesis, God comes looking for his friends and he wants to be in relationship with them. And, and he, he makes a promise in chapter three of Genesis that he is going to send a rescuer who will make wrongs right and who will restore all things. And the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I will make all things new. And so God is on a mission. It's a salvation story. And so this is the premise of our faith is that every human being needs rescue. Uh, we have a, um, it's a terminal condition. Um, the Bible uses the word sin. And for some people who are outside the faith, uh, they may be a little confused on what that word means. That word really just means 
we were meant to hit the bullseye with our life, but we, we go left or we go right, we go up or down and we miss the target. Like we literally don't just miss the bullseye, we miss the target. And every human being would acknowledge that they're imperfect and flawed. Um, that's what scripture is saying, that we, uh, we don't hit the target with our life. And so God comes in Christ and he is on a rescue mission. He is uh, writing a salvation story and we're invited into this salvation story where we can partner with God in helping to make the world brand new. I love what the Jewish people say. They say, once you've had a, an open eye to God and once you've had an open heart to him and you are walking with God, the rest of your life is about giving yourself to repairing the world. We're to be repairers of the world. And uh, this is the mission that, that God is on. So I wanna, uh, again, thank the people from Alpha. Nikki Gumbel is the founder, creator of the Alpha Movement. And uh, he has served as a pastor at Holy Brompton Trinity in, in, uh, in England. And uh, he's gonna give a, just a brief little talk here as part of our scripture talk. Uh, the Bible's inspired over 1600 years 40 plus authors, one architect, but that doesn't mean there aren't problems or challenges with reading the Bible. So here's Nikki Gumbel. Over a period of 1600 years, the Bible was written by at least 40 authors, kings, scholars, poor people, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, teachers, prophets, doctors, they wrote different types of literature, such as history, poetry, prophecy, and letters. So the Bible is 100% the work of human authors, but it's also 100% inspired by God. How can that be? St. Paul's Cathedral in London was built by Sir Christopher Wren, the greatest English architect of his time. Construction started in 1675 when he was 43 years old and continued under his direction for 36 years. It was completed in 1711 when he was 79 years of age. Now, while Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral, he didn't actually lay a single stone. There were many people involved, stonemasons, carpenters, laborers and artists. But Sir Christopher Wren was the inspiration behind it all. With the Bible, there are many different writers, but one architect, one inspiration behind it all, God himself. That doesn't mean that there are no difficulties. The Apostle Peter, talking about some of Paul's letters, says there are some things in them that I find really hard to understand. Of course, there are many difficulties in the Bible, moral and historical difficulties and apparent contradictions. And if you've ever tried to read the Old Testament, you know that there are some shocking things that happened. And you might think, well, how can that be inspired by God? It's a bit like suffering and the love of God. At the heart of Christianity is the love of God. But then you look at the world and you see this massive amount of suffering and you think, how can you hold together the love of God and suffering in the world? It's not easy. And similarly, how can you hold together the inspiration of scripture and the difficult stuff that we come across in the Bible? Some of these contradictions can be overcome by understanding the type of literature that you're reading and the context that it was written in. And Jesus is the key to interpreting what we read. Jesus is love. He's the supreme revelation of God. If we want to know what God is like, he is like Jesus. Jesus is the key to understanding the Bible. Now, we could spend some time this morning doing a deep dive into talking about, is the Bible trustworthy? And we could talk about early manuscripts and we could talk about archeology span and we could talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, we could talk about personal experience and um, we could do a deeper dive, but that would, that would take a really long time and we might leave those conversations to the scholars. This is the simplest way for us to bring credibility or at least have a conversation about the credibility of the Bible is by considering that Jesus is literally the key to understanding scripture. Um, so let's start with this. Jesus holds the Bible in high regard. Um, really quickly, Jesus faces his own series of temptations in Matthew's gospel. And uh, in chapter four, he's led by the spirit into the wilderness. He is tempted by Satan for over 40 days. And we just get a little snapshot from the gospel writer. And when Satan comes and tempts him, three times Jesus resists the temptation of Satan. And he says these words, he says, it is written and he quotes a passage of scripture from the Old Testament. 
So Jesus saw scripture as being very helpful for him when it came to navigating his own spiritual journey, so to speak, and when he was facing temptation, but he saw scripture as authoritative and that there was a power in it. And he quoted it and he memorized it and he held it in high esteem. Uh, he reads scripture in the synagogue in Luke chapter four, verses 18 through 22. We find this story where Jesus is gathering for worship with his, his friends. And uh, the text says this, as Jesus quotes it, Jesus reads from the scroll of scripture in a public environment. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has, no, has, he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then the text tells us this, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So it's really interesting that Jesus reads scripture because he sees value in public reading of scripture. And he also sees it as being a living document that is finding its fulfillment in Jesus, in himself. And he's actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. And, uh, and then later near the end, after he had been crucified, after he was raised from the dead in Luke chapter 24, he saw scripture um, pointing to him specifically. Uh, in Luke chapter 24, he's talking to these two men on the road to Emmaus, and they were talking about all the happenings in Jerusalem after Jesus had been crucified. And, and then it says at the end of this interaction that Jesus has, he just appears with these two men walking on the road to Emmaus, has a conversation. And he says, and beginning with Moses, this is what Luke records, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. And so Jesus had a high regard for the Bible. So if we're gonna talk about the credibility of scripture, we need to first of all, think about Jesus. If we have high regard for Jesus, then we also should have high regard for scripture because Jesus had high regard for scripture. And he didn't see uh, the Bible as just being another document. Uh, he didn't see the Older Testament specifically as just being uh, literature. He saw it as being authoritative, uh, extremely helpful, and uh, worth treating it as a sacred text. And uh, so because I hold Jesus in high regard, he is the primary reason why I hold scripture in high regard. And as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of other reasons why we should, from the reliability of manuscripts, from historical uh, documents called the Dead Sea Scrolls, from archeological discoveries, there are a host of reasons, but Jesus is the most important one and the starting point for all of us. So why should we read the Bible, number two? Um, there are significant benefits to reading the Bible. And uh, we are presented with some challenges when it comes to reading scripture, no question about it. Uh, but we have some significant challenges in life when we uh, choose not to read the Bible. Um, I, I love this author and I quote him often, Dallas Willard. He, he wrote a book called Life Without Lack and I just happen to be reading it now. And um, uh, this is what he, he has written in this book. I wrote it down this week because it just had lots to do with what we're talking about this morning. He writes, we do not have the option of a neutral mind. He says, if we are not entertaining God's truth, we will be entertaining Satan's lies. Ideas are subtle things. As with the motion of the earth, which occurs without our noticing it, we are normally unaware of the ideas moving us. We are hurtling through space at an incredible speed. If you think about it much, it may make you wanna lie down and hug the earth. The ideas that govern our lifestyles are even more disconcerting for they cause people to behave in ways that undermine their own well-being. And so uh, when we are not, again, informing our mind with God's truth, because our um, minds are never neutral, we are vulnerable and susceptible to Satan's lies and all sorts of thoughts and musings from our unhealthy self that can lead us off the good, tested, tried and true path that leads to life and find ourselves oftentimes in the ditches or derailing ourselves or just moving off into unhealthy, unhealthy directions. So why read the Bible? Um, Psalm 119, it's a book of poems and songs written by the Hebrew people. And they would sing them and recite them. And it was, it was like their song book. 
And uh, they are a beautiful collection of poems that um, capture every human emotion as it relates to being a person of faith. So really quickly, I just read through Psalm 119 this week, and uh, I found these five simple but very helpful principles that come right out of Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, and the whole chapter is given to um, elevating the role of Scripture, God's Word, and, and how it holds out value, the benefits for people who immerse themselves in scripture. So um, here's the first one. I've got five real quick. I'll just read a principle and a passage and keep moving. So here it is. It keeps us from sin and evil. When we read the Bible, it helps keep us from sin and evil. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the psalmist says that if we actually take God's word, read it, tuck it away in our heart, meditate on it, muse on it, it'll keep us from sin and evil. A wonderful thing. It'll, it'll prevent us from missing the target more dramatically with our lives. Secondly, it provides wise counsel for those who read. Uh, verse 24 of Psalm 119, your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. Uh, every now and then we need a good wise counselor because life can be challenging, it can be complex, and we can lose our way. And uh, sitting down with a wise Faith-informed counselor can be so helpful. And um, the writer of the Psalms says that scripture can be that for us. The scripture can be a wise counselor. And uh, so it provides wise counsel. Thirdly, it leads to freedom. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive for people because they think the Bible is intended to kind of keep people imprisoned. Uh, scripture actually releases us to live the best life possible, invites us into the way of God, into our design. We were made on purpose, for a purpose, and scripture helps us understand what that purpose is. Uh, so it leads to freedom. Verse 45 of Psalm 119, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. When I pursue your precepts, your pathway, uh, it leads me to a big open space, space. It leads me to a place of great freedom. And then fourthly, it comforts us in times of distress. Um, I remember, Lord, in verse 52, your ancient laws, and I find comfort in them. When life gets hard, when we are dealt a curveball, and uh, we are just reeling from pain uh, and heartache, uh, Scripture holds out comfort for us. And uh, we, we serve ourselves well when we read it, and we access that kind of comfort he, he holds out. And then finally, number five, Scripture guides us. Your word is a lamp for my feet a light for my path. And so there's this picture of walking a dark path and scriptures like a lamp or a candle, something that illuminates our way. So we stay out of the potholes and the ditches. And so um, why read the Bible? The Bible ha holds out a host of benefits for us. All right, finally, number three, I wanna leave you with these thoughts. How to read and understand the Bible. Uh, again, the Bible is not an easy book to read or understand. And, and Peter wrote these words, an early Christian. He said, um, Paul's letters, so this was another early church writer, the Apostle Paul. Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So Peter writes and says, by the way, there, there are some tough passages. It's not all easy reading. It can be challenging from time to time. And that's one of the values of gathering as a church and being involved in a Christian community and uh, you know, reading good, um, sound, helpful devotional books. It just helps illuminate and help us um, understand some challenging parts of scripture. Uh, I think it's really helpful to read a contemporary version of the Bible. I read the New Living Translation. If you're new to the Bible, and if you have a smartphone, you can go to uh, the App Store and download the, the Bible app, or it's uh, the YouVersion Bible app, and they have a host of, it's all free, free version, uh, free, free Bibles, um, there's the message version, there's the New Living Translation, there's a host of easy, accessible Bible versions. I would encourage you to find an, an easy to read contemporary version of the Bible. And there's a host of reading plans there for you. If you haven't discovered that yet, I really want to encourage you to do so. So some helpful tips on how to read the Bible responsibly. Here we go. Ready? Real quick. Consider the literary style. Is it poetry, parable, prophets, historical? Is it apocalyptic, which is highly symbolic? Um, we don't always read the Bible literally. Jesus himself said, by the way, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. He wasn't literally saying, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. Um, so we don't read that passage literally. There's symbol, there's metaphor. 
Uh, we, we don't read it literally, we, we take it seriously. Jesus is saying, by the way, deal aggressively and, and seriously with those things that cause you to sin, to miss the target with your life. So consider the literary style. Um, secondly, remember the first reader principle. What did the original audience understand the writer to say? He, he wasn't writing or she wasn't writing to a, 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 a 21st century audience, but to a, a historical audience. So once we um, understand what the initial hearer was hearing, then we can apply it to where we live today. If we miss that step, we go right from reading to application and we don't understand what the original hearer said, then we might distort uh, what the Bible is trying to teach. And then every passage was written to a cultural audience. Again, seek first to understand, then to apply. And there are some fantastic free tools online, commentaries that you can find that will help you understand the cultural background of every passage. And again, it's not easy and it requires a bit of work, but God's truth is worth digging for. And when you find the pearl of great price, when you find the treasure, it has the power and potential to literally change your life. All right, we're gonna use an, uh, an acronym called SOAP, S-O-A-P, Scripture. Start with Scripture, read a passage of Scripture every day. O is observation, what's happening in the text? Maybe read it a couple of times. Ask yourself some questions. What does this passage teach me about God? What does this passage teach me about myself? And what is the call to action from this passage? Scripture observation, A, application. Are there any adjustments, any behavior changes that need to happen in my life? Any words that I'm speaking that I should adjust? Attitudes, behaviors, whatever that might look like. And then finally, P is prayer. After we've read, after we've observed, after we've applied, then we pray. Because this is a living, vibrant faith, not with a book, but with the God who inspired it. We move, we move through the scriptures to the God who inspired them. And then I just want to leave you with this last thought. Uh, there was a young boy by the name of Samuel. Uh, there was a priest named Eli, and they lived in the temple. This story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And this young boy went to bed at night, and he would hear a whisper. And he thought it was Eli calling him, and twice he got out of bed to say, what is it that you want? I, I heard you call me. And Eli said, go back to bed. And on the second occasion, he said, go back to bed and ask God, say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that's really our mature and healthy approach to the Bible. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And if we come with that kind of posture, you know what? God's going to speak with us. He's going to speak to us through the text of Holy Scripture. And we'll just wrap up with this last passage, Psalm 119, 138. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. And this is important for us as we consider this series. They are fully trustworthy. You can trust the Bible and you can trust the author who inspired it. There may be hard parts to understand. There might be some areas of apparent contradiction that we need to wrestle through. Uh, but the Bible is a beautiful book. It's a gift from God to help us discover who he is, what he's like, and what he is inviting us into together, which is a life transforming relationship with him. So I wanna pray for you just before Pastor Kristen comes back and wraps up. Uh, Father, thank you again today for the gift of time together. Though we may be separated and uh, living in different spaces and not meeting in person, we are together now. And as we consider your word and the potential it holds out for personal transformation and societal transformation, we pray, God, that you would help us to come to the Bible with humility. Uh, most importantly, pursuing the author, the architect of scripture, so that we can truly become the people you asked us and invite us to become. Lord, we thank you again that you've got great plans for us as the human family. Help us, Lord, collectively to move towards you. Thank you for the community of faith. Thank you for honest searching questions that we have because on the other side of them is a deeper faith. I pray that you would bless each and every one of my friends today and help them to grow and to become the people you want them to be. And we pray this in the awesome name of Jesus Christ, who is forever Lord and Savior, amen.
Thank you, Pastor Dave, for an awesome scripture talk this morning about trusting the Bible and giving us practical ways on how to read it with its context and all the literary styles that it comes with. And so we're just so glad that you have joined us this morning. Just a reminder, if you want to connect with one of our pastors, um, you can reach out by filling out a connect card at www.tainstreet.org. And also you can find a link on um, for giving as well. And we appreciate your help throughout this time. Let's just pray and then I'm going to end with a benediction. Lord, uh, we just thank you for this entire morning that we got to spend with you and one another and that it looks different. And God, we're, we are just so thankful for your word and the wisdom and guidance and encouragement and conviction and challenging that it brings to us. We trust in the Bible. And so God, as Pastor Dave has already said this morning, that God, that there is so much about the Bible that we get to understand with its different contexts and, and all the things that it brings. And so Lord, just help us to see what you want us to see in the word and to help us interpret all that it says. God, we know that it is good and we know that you gave it to us for a reason. And so convict us this week to spend time with you and in the word and encourage us in that. That Lord, in this time, we know that you have given us all that we need. And so Lord, would you, would you just um, be with us for the rest of this week? We thank you and we love you and we just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Um, as a benediction to you this morning, I'm, be, I'm going to read Ephesians 3 uh, verses 20 and 21. And it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We hope you have a blessed week.